Thank you all for joining us today uh, for this session on the Commission on the Status of Women's Side event, UN House Scotland on the Ways We Live on the Land. During this conversation across contexts and continents, we will hear from women working on themes of climate change and gender equality. And we're delighted that we're able to be part of the wider CSW programme addressing these issues. My name is Dr Gary Don and I'm the founder and executive director of UN House Scotland. And for, for the past 10 years, we at UN House have acted as a bridge between civil society, the Scottish Parliament and the UN to provide spaces for discussion and implementation of UN goals and values in Scotland. We are a women-led organisation with around 40 interns and volunteers working on 15 teams, including on climate and gender, nuclear non-proliferation, human rights and human trafficking. Over the past year, Scotland has had an important role on the global stage for climate action. COP26 in Glasgow last November was a focal point for both Scottish and international civil society groups working on these issues, especially at the local level. The United Nations Association, as a member of COP coalition, was an active participant of the People's Summit and the Movement Assemblies, in which we heard from and engaged with women and indigenous leaders about climate justice and grassroots action for change. As you know, this year's CSW is concerned with achieving gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programmes. This means recognising, as the CSW states, that gender inequality coupled with climate environmental crises and disasters are the greatest sustainable development challenges of our time, with particular and disproportionate impact on women and girls. In the face of such challenges, we at UN House Scotland believe more than ever that SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals, is key to ensuring a healthier, safer and more just world for all. We are surely better able to achieve gender equality, including having more women in decision making positions, if we work together at the grassroots level to collaborate, to come together and make change happen. In the lead up to COP26 and as part of its legacy, our climate and gender team launched their podcast series, Connecting Women's Voices on Climate Justice, which has now published 77 episodes with our partners in Scotland, Zimbabwe, Ecuador, Canada, Germany, to name a few. It was also named by the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network as one of Scotland's top 10 climate podcasts. We are so glad that some of the inspiring speakers of the podcast series have returned to join us for this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are really looking forward to hearing from all of you here as we consider and reflect upon our relationship with the land and especially how this might be changing during these critical moments for our planet and for all of us who call it home. So I'll hand over to Georgia now to give you more details on the event structure and our guest speakers and UN House partners. But before I do, may I just say to those who have helped with this um, session, our team at UN House Scotland, would you just wave to everyone so that they can see you and know that you have been part of something that has been incredibly interesting to arrange and we're delighted that everyone is here today. So thank you so much once again, everyone, for joining us. And, and we do hope that you'll keep in touch with UN House Scotland and be put in touch with future events, with our seminars, with our roundtables and with our various newsletters. Please do keep in touch and thank you for joining us today. Over to you, Georgia. Hey, thank you, Gary, for that introduction to our event. 
My name is Georgia Saiti, and as well as being part of UN House Scotland's climate and gender team, I'm also studying a master's degree in climate justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. On behalf of the whole team, I would like to thank you for being here with us today. We are delighted to bring together speakers and guests from our podcast series to join us in conversation about the ways we live on the land, including through our relationships with water, food security, climate resilience, land resources, environmental art and activism. Please do feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from and why you're interested in these issues. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to please remind everyone to mute yourselves if you're not presenting. If you have a question, please use the chat box and one of our team members will make sure to address it after the panel discussion or in the breakout rooms. We will be recording both the main session and the breakout room sessions. So if you do not want to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. We will kick off our event today with a panel discussion addressing the central themes of gender and climate justice, water access, and the impact of environmental issues on women and girls. We will then be breaking out into conversation groups that will be automatically allocated. If anyone is especially keen to go to a specific breakout room, please indicate this now in the chat. Kat has just put the information about the breakout rooms in the chat. Um, we do want to remind everyone, however, that all sessions will be recorded so you can catch up on the conversations after this event. We will also be sharing and feeding back about our conversations from each breakout room once we return to the main session towards the end of the event. Our event will end with concluding remarks from Claudia Bemis former Scottish Labour MSP for South Scotland, and also the former party spokesperson on environment, climate change and land reform. I will now like to pass the floor to Kat, who will be moderating the panel discussion today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Georgia and Gary, and for everybody um, for being here today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to extend this space as part of the Commission on the Status of Women um, side events. My name is Katrina Spaven Don. I'm a member of the Climate and Gender Team at UN House Scotland. Um, I also work on women's rights and environmental justice. Uh, please turn off your mic if you're not speaking. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I will be facilitating the breakout room on regenerative agriculture. Uh, to share a bit about my experiences uh, here launching a nature education project in the Maya Ishil region of Guatemala. Um, before that, it's my pleasure to moderate the panel, panel discussion with our speakers. So I will be introducing them and asking uh, each of our speakers a question and then hopefully we'll have some time to have a, a conversation amongst all of our speakers in, in the last minutes before we head into our breakout rooms. So it's my pleasure to introduce May East. May is a sustainability educator, a spatial planner, and a social innovator. Her work spans the fields of cultural geography, urban ecology, and women's studies. Hello, May. I'm muted. Now I am, I am muted. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So May, in our podcast episode together, some months ago now, um, at the intersection, Gender, Climate, and Regenerative Futures, we talked about the ways that gender and climate justice are intrinsically linked. I'd love it if you could tell us a bit more about this and about the impacts of climate change that you've seen on girls and women in your work and in your research. Well, let's say that the starting point of all my work with women and food systems was very much the concern about the impactful effects of industrial food systems based on large scale energy and resource intensive agribusiness enterprise operation in the global south. So I have been over the last 15, 18 years developing a series of capacity building projects um, co-created, co-developed with partners in Bangladesh, Senegal, India, and even Sicily to support communities to transition from this input intensive agriculture introduced by forces of globalization. These are communities that have been, you know, um, for, for many, many generations have a, a very close and intimate 
relationship to land, to soil, to, nour to nourishment and to health. But somehow they have been introduced to input intensive agriculture by forces of globalization and um, re-establishing agroecological food production systems, uh, featuring very much the revival of the indigenous knowledge. Uh, I think in, in our breakout room, I can tell you more about the work that we've been doing into turning salinated uh, soils in, in Kuna, Bagarhat, in Bangladesh into productive soils and desert lands in the Sahel, and all always working with women because they have this deep connection with the soil. And, um, and one of the things that I realized over the years that healthy soils are related to healthy communities. Thank you so much, May. Um, I think, as you say, healthy soils and healthy communities will very much uh, be the focus of, of our breakout room on regenerative agriculture. Um, and, you know, to carry on the conversation around the impact on girls and women, um, I'm really happy to introduce Kirsten Danner and Fadzai Munodawafa Bura Bura. Um, I'm not sure if Fadzai is here. Has she managed to join us? Kirsten, have you seen if she's there in the chat or in the... No, I'm not, I'm not contacting her on WhatsApp. I'm off my camera, come on, connect me to this, yes. So that I don't bother you. Okay, was that Fadzai responding there? No, no, okay. Okay, well, in the meantime, Kirsten, thanks so much for joining us. Kirsten is a water specialist, researcher, and facilitator with over 20 years of experience um, working in over 15 countries in sub Saharan Africa and around the world. Her passion is water supply and groundwater resources. Thank you for joining us, Kirsten. You're welcome. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, we were really delighted you're able to join us again after our the really interesting podcast episode that we recorded with you last year. Um, and Fadzai can hopefully join us shortly, but in the meantime, I'd love to ask you, Kirsten, um, about your work, um, specifically with girls and women in communities of sub-Saharan Africa, and, and about um, access to water and, and how... Um, how we ensure that women's voices are heard and their specific experiences are understood and responded to, especially in water and, sanita and sanitation services. Great, thanks, thanks, and thanks for the great question. Um, my answer is, is quite simple. It's ask the women and the girls, ask them, listen to them, give them voice, give them a platform to be able to articulate their issues. And sometimes that's done better without men, without boys, separately in different groups, um, but it's really about listening. Um, it's also, I think, important, you know, you mentioned women, girls and, and other kind of marginalized or vulnerable groups. And I think there a lot comes down to taboos, you know, taboos towards women and taboos towards other group. And we all, um, you know, suffer from these taboos. So there are lots of groups that really need to be brought in and, and heard and listened to about their needs for water. You know, persons with dis people with disabilities, for example, and there are organizations that represent people with disabilities, comprising people with disabilities or others who advocate for them. So that's, you know, another group pastoralists massively overlooked despite the huge importance of pastoralism around the world um, a taboo group that are often not consulted at all what about sex workers what are their needs what about women in prisons you know just trying to touch on some of the other taboos so you know we may judge somebody else's taboo but we may have our own as well so a lot of these vulnerable groups are actually stigmatized groups as well. So it's, but it's important to engage and listen. Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, it will be a really interesting and engaging discussion to hear more about these issues in the breakout room on, on water. Um, I'd also like to mention that Fadzai hopefully will be joining us for that breakout room. Um, Fadzai has seven years experience in the water and sanitation field and at coordinator levels with responsibility in managing borehole drilling enterprises, emergency response, assessments, planning, implementation, and evaluation of, of water and sanitation programs. So hopefully she can tell us more about that in the breakout room um, when she's able to join us. 
So continuing on the theme of, of water and gender, we're really delighted that Karen um, Helwig is able to join us today. Karen's research background is in water pollution and water management, and she's currently the program leader of the MSc in climate justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. Thank you, Karen, for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks for, for inviting me. It's very exciting. Great yeah, we're to delighted part. to share yeah. the space and, and, and also um, I'll just mention as well that we are also sharing the space with a number of your students um, who are, are also part of the Climate Justice MSc at Glasgow Caledonia and are part of the UN House Scotland Climate and Gender Team. So we're really delighted to have this partnership and be working on this yeah. together. Um, I saw some familiar names so, in the participant list, yeah. so good to see you all. Can you tell us, Karen, um, about the themes that you're seeing emerging in, in students' research and also in your own research around climate, water and gender justice? Oh, um, yeah, I think um, we see a lot of um, students focusing on gender uh, as part of climate justice. Um, we, we, we've got a really broad range of, uh, of topics, though, amongst our students. But recently, there have actually been a couple of um, studies about uh, pastoralist women, which um, was just mentioned, um, which has been really interesting um, because all these traditional migration routes are changing. And um, that has an impact on, you know, a different impact on men than uh, it has on women. Often the men end up having to move further afield um, and the women are left behind. Um, other uh, the themes that we've seen recently have, have focused much more locally. GCU, our university is based in Glasgow, and um, we had a student looking into Glasgow's response to the climate emergency. So that is something that students, I think, also find really interesting as well what's happening um, right where we are, because uh, climate change is, is it's here and it's now, and it's not something far away for the future. Um, and then, yeah, there's, there's lots of other issues too, like uh, more technical issues like uh, carbon questions and things like that as well. Environmental justice is a big theme. Um, so yeah, that's just a snapshot. Thank you, Karen, and, and we look forward to hearing more as well um, as we could get into, into more detailed discussions uh, in the second part of the, this event. Um, we were also really delighted to, to record a podcast episode around environmental art, which is one of the other key themes um, of this event today. So I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Nicole Dextra, Karen Hackenberg, and Janine Jafar. Um, in different ways, these, these three artists um, and artivists, I might say, um, are, are working um, on, on similar and kind of intersectional themes. So Nicole Dextra um, is an award-winning environmental artist uh, working with a multitude of media, creating art exhibitions around the world, Spain, Spain Toronto, Mongolia, to name a few. Um, through her art, she underlines themes of drought, environmental degradation, and is best known for her, her botanical wearable dresses. Um, so do, do check those out so you can get a visual as well of what that looks like. I'm going to introduce all three of you and then pose a question to the three of you. Um, so maybe you can answer in the order that I read out your bios. Um, Karen Hackenberg is an award-winning environmental artist who received her BFA in painting from Rhode Island School of Design. She addresses topics of ocean degradation and plastic pollution through her art, including in recycled sculptures and floating world paintings. Again, I encourage you to, to check out Karen. Karen and Nicole, if you want to put um, uh, web addresses in the chat, then do that so that people can have easy access to check out your, your work. Um, and finally, Janine Jafar. Uh, Janine is a student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and her studies are focused on sustainable development following from a persistent interest in environmental issues. Her experiences in this area are, are focused on the field of fashion, most recently as part of the Sustainable Initiative at the St Andrews Charity Fashion Show, which is Scotland's oldest and largest student-run fashion show. Thank you to the three of you for joining us here. So Thank you. The question for the three of you, um, Nicole, Karen and Janine is about um, your work and how um, the visibility of women in art and in activism 
might be changing and developing at this time? What have you seen in your work specifically related to, to climate justice? Um, so I'll start. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yes. So uh, my name is Nicole and uh, I am an artist. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. And um, the work that I'm doing ha does involve uh, fashion, uh, but in a very sort of uh, uh, more of an ideal way. I started making a project called Weed Robes in, starting in 2005. And I made garments made out of plant material. And the, um, the theme of that was wear it and compost it. So it was really about bringing uh, nature to the body, to ourselves, as a, a creating a, a more direct uh, relationship with nature. So, and it also to, to make us think of things like uh, fast fashion and slow fashion and things like that. Back in 2005, those words didn't even exist. Um, so uh, my sort of, you know, uh, going through the, my whole process took a long time to develop this thing. There wasn't very much information on that. But um, it, through the years, I found there's two uh, organizations that I belong to, and one of them is called uh, WEAD, W-E-A-D, uh, Women Equal Artists Dialogue. They're based in the U.S., and they are uh, primarily a group of women. I think they do accept men, but um, their, their aim is more eco-feminist art. And uh, the other uh, place is actually eco art space. Eco art space is uh, gender neutral. It doesn't matter who is in there. And both of those things are more online platforms. So you can belong to it. You can have a profile there, um, but they don't do a lot of exhibitions. So I would say that, um, you know, environmental art was started in the 70s, mostly by a group of men. There were a few women um, who did very large works in the landscape. So, you know, bulldozers and, and, and that kind of thing. And uh, that environmental art today is actually very women-centric and, um, and on a scale that's more manageable. And um, also, uh, the idea of the art itself, the way that it's created is in, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, with the environment. So th whereas the, the first pieces that were done in environmental art were not environmental in the way that they were done. They were just speaking about environmental issues, which was important because at that time, none of that existed in the art world. Uh, but now the process and the way that an artist actually approaches their work is very important. Um, so some of the things that I'm dealing with are, um, right now I'm creating three films and they are uh, based on floods and desertification and fires. So they're all environmental things that are happening today in my neighborhood and uh, that we're all very familiar with. And uh, so that's the work that I'm concentrating on now. Great, thanks so much. Karen. Yes, um, hello everybody. I'm just really thrilled to be here with you all and hearing um, your journeys and all the wonderful things you're doing. So thanks again. Um, I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about how I got where I am now. Um, I grew up in a rural environment in uh, the, the Northeast USA and I can't Hard, I can hardly remember a time when I wasn't interested in the natural world. Um, I spent a lot of time on the land observing animals and um, um, really um, just very engaged in nature. Um, family legacy, just a sort of possibly a natural result of growing up in a um, you know, rural environment. And uh, can remember being concerned about the state of a polluted um, water uh, body of water on the ocean that uh, we weren't allowed to swim in. And uh, I was very young when I was puzzling about that, that whole topic. Uh, jumping forward, um, when I went to college, 
another episode, another event that really influenced my life was participating in a program um, at the time called Artists for Environment in Western New Jersey. Uh, most people don't think New Jersey has a whole lot of natural environment, but um, in the Western part of, uh, uh, West of New Jersey, it's quite rural. And that program was developed by someone to um, engage artists with the natural world to uh, promote the beauty of the natural wor world. And it was focused on landscape painting and working with um, artists of the New York School from New York. Uh, we'll jump again over many years, uh, ended up working in design in order to support my creative pursuits and uh, was working for Esprit de Corps in the fashion industry in San Francisco. Um, Doug Tompkins, the uh, owner of the company at the time was uh, highly in, in involved in um, environmental issues. And finally, when he sold the company, he um, moved to Patagonia and saved millions and millions of um, acres of um, natural wilderness down there, which is a really long story. Um, and at the time, we, I was working with a good friend, Linda Gross, um, on a project um, on, a, on a line of clothing called e-collection, and it was sort of the first of its um, time. Um, and also with Sally Fox, who was developing organic cotton at the time. And uh, we worked with a women's group in Appalachia to help uh, give them uh, economic support by uh, giving them parts of the uh, garments that were being produced um, to manufacture there, specifically wooden buttons that were hand painted. And um, that's just one small part of what e-collection was about, but um, I loved the idea of, of giving a sustainable income to people who didn't have a lot of options to women in particular. So then jumping forward again to where I currently live, I live on a beautiful um, bay in um, uh, Port Townsend, Washington, um, Discovery Bay um, in the Pacific Northwest. And when I moved here, um, a lot of my concerns about the environment came to full fruition um, in the fact that I started re-engaging more with my um, where I started with um, painting and sculpture from my art training. And um, I found my voice um, when I transitioned from doing straight landscape painting to working with the trash that I found on the beach. And um, I think as I've been reflecting as we started this meeting, I, I was realizing that it took me some time to find my voice because there wasn't a lot of support for um, I think a woman's perspective in the art world. Um, all of the uh, people that were offered to be to model were mostly men, and some of the art movements that were male oriented. So I guess in some ways I hadn't really realized that, but looking back on it, <clears throat> uh, on, on top of a, a variety of other things like. Um, you know, providing a living for myself. <clears throat> I think that was one of the reasons it took me quite a while and maybe until I was 45 to really find my true voice as a female artist. And um, so I started this series of paintings of the objects I find on the beach set in a natural setting. I'm currently um, working on a series called Unnatural Disasters which features some of the beach trash with a patterned background that reflects um, sort of the mega disasters that happen or are starting to happen as a result of, of climate change. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, we look forward to hearing more as well in, in the breakout room that will be starting in just a couple of minutes. So before then, Janine, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today um, and for the introduction. Um, so my name is Janine. I currently go to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and I study sustainable development. Um, I have a keen interest in sustainable fashion, hence why I'm here today. I'm part of the St. Andrews Charity Fashion Show. Um, it's the largest, most successful student-run fashion show in Scotland um, and it's like the first of its kind in the United King Kingdom. Um, specifically, 
FS works to promote all voices through art and fashion and often incorporates elements of activism and environmental justice through various campaigns. Um, this is especially seen this year through our theme, which is encompassing environments, focusing on Scottish history, culture and art and the ways in which climate change has affected the country. Um, FS has constantly included strong female voices. Um, it continues to do so within every activity we create. Um, specifically, what I work on is I work on panelist discussions focusing on sustainable fashion, um, whether that be through the social elements or the environmental elements, um, as well as kind of like clothing drives, revamping clothes. Um, we collaborate with um, an organization in Scotland that reforests the Highlands. It's called Mossy Earth. Um, and yeah, I think it's crucial to note that a lot of uh, visible activism can be highly performative, um, which in the fast fashion industry is seen as greenwashing. Um, I think a great example in the art industry specifically is the whitewashing of, of um, art in the respect of people buying climate related art or um, art made by people within the BAME community or by women, just as a statement to kind of be perceived as like, let's say woke, um, but how much, I mean, I think it's important to like very much notice that how much impact do those actions actually make, um, but yeah. Thank you so much, Janine, and, and thank you to all of you. Um, as you can see, we have a really diverse range of interests, expertise, um, which we're going to be getting into more detail now um, in our three breakout rooms. Thank you for those of you who have put in the chat um, your, your preferences for breakout rooms. Um, Andy will be making sure that happens. He is our UN House Scotland um, tech guru. So if there's any issues, then you can come back to the main room. Andy will be here to sort out any, any concerns that anybody has, but we will now be flitting into our three breakout rooms on um, agriculture, uh, water and gender, and environmental art. So we really look forward to hearing more from all of you who are here today. And then we will be coming back into this space at, at between 5.10 and 5.15 for a, for a feeding back on the breakout sessions and then concluding remarks from, from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everyone for all of your contributions in the breakout rooms. Um, I know from our conversation on water and gender, um, we've discussed some really good um, ideas and thoughts. Um, we'd love to hear a summary of each breakout rooms conversations. If someone would like to volunteer um, from each breakout group to give us an idea of the main themes you talk about and any ideas that came up in response to the questions and dialogues. Um, we have about one minute for feedback from each group. Yes, Otavia, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, so I was in the art and art uh, and activism group, and uh, we had an amazing discussion. Um, thank you so much for to all the panelists. Um, you guys are amazing. Um, so to summarize our discussion. Um, we started with a kind of summary of kind of what is environmental art um, and why is art important in our world, especially in the changing climate. Um, we had a really inter interesting discussion and a lot of inputs, um, but to summarize kind of art is necessary to tackle environmental issues. It's something that's public and everyone can access and that's what makes it very valuable. Um, it allows us to bridge the gaps between different generations, communities, languages, cultures um, and societies and it allows us to engage with critical issues that really matter to people um, and everyone can talk about. Um, each panelist kind of discuss their work. Uh, Nicole's current projects on film were really interesting um, and how they kind of capture how people are innovating in the changing climate. Karen, how she brings in humor and irony um, to kind of change the stubbornness of people to climate change and accepting that it's reality and something that's gonna affect us. And finally, Janine, in her work on recycling, challenging fast fashion, and cha challenging greenwashing, um, and how we're going to, uh, you need to think about responsible choices and educating people in that way. And we concluded that um, the, the best way forward from now is for activists um, and for young women to create a platform to join together 
um, and to kind of what Karen said at the end to kind of follow your passion uh, speak out on what really matters and kind of just keep going until you make a change in kind of what you really really believe in and that's kind of very important in environmental art and environmental activism so very inspiring to thank thank you all very much Great, okay, thank you so much, Otevia. Um, any volunteers for the farming and agricultural um, group? Um. We, we had a really great discussion um, around uh, regenerative and holistic food systems. Um, we, we thought about the impacts of um, the impacts of our relationship on the land, especially as May, May East said about co-creation in communities, um, about thinking of the health of the soil and the health of the people who rely on the health of the soil, which is of course all of us. We talked about shortening our supply chains, about, um, about working within communities to ensure, for example, in eco schools, in vegetable gardens, in urban allotments, in whatever the space is, that you know, we are able to grow food wherever we are. We're able to eat seasonally and make changes so that we can ensure um, that we look after the land that we live on and that we are able to feed ourselves, whether or not that's in an indigenous community in Guatemala, or in a pastoral community in Nigeria where women's access to the land is, is limited and the responsibility on women to produce and to feed families is often significant. And at the end, we had a great um, interactive activity which unfortunately got cut off, but thank you everybody in our breakout room for sharing your ideas on drawing or reflecting in words, what does a regenerative and holistic food system look like for the future? And we have heard and saw some ideas on everybody working on the land, having access to the land, living in dignity, um, working at grassroots level in collaboration, um, ensuring that you know, we are uh, supporting the communities that are food producers. Um, and, uh, and we heard from people around the world about what it means to, to produce our own food and, and, and uh, be empowered in that process um, to, to, to ensure that, um, that we are closer to, as consumers, to the producers that are working on the land. That's a bit of a summary. Thank you, everybody, for the breakout room. It was great. Great. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, any volunteers for the Water and Gender Breakout Group? I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I think the discussion uh, was um, very um, um, uh, taking away of a turn because there was a lot going on in the chat. It was hard to keep up with the chat and um, a, a lot of great links were shared. And um, in the group, the water and gender conversation indicated that there is a direct relationship between gender equality, women empowerment and climate change. It was very well explained how women are, are disproportionately vulnerable to the effects of climate change, which could in turn exasperate the existing gender disparities. It was also uh, shared how women have unique knowledge and skills that can help uh, make the response to climate change more effective and sustainable. Very um, interesting presentations and uh, case studies were shared, uh, giving us a bit of more understanding of strong connection of women with water um, and how it's affecting women and how they can be the solution. Um, I think that's a precise summary of what we were discussing. Great. Um, thank you so much for sharing these engaging and motivating ideas from the breakout groups. Um, we're so glad to have had the opportunity to contribute to this year's CSW and the discussion around themes of climate and gender justice. We would love to keep in touch with you and keep the conversation going, so please do join you in House Scotland's mailing list or email us at the Climate and Gender Team email address to get involved or share, share an idea. We'd love to hear from you. Um, the links are in the chat now. Before ending my closing remarks, I would like to convey a special thanks to all the team members of our climate and gender team 
to our executive director, Gary Don, and of course, our mentor, Pat Black, for the valuable contribution. To close our event, it is my great pleasure now to introduce Claudia Bimis to summarize our conversations today and reflect on the ways we live on the land at, the, at this critical time for both the environment and gender equality in Scotland and across the world. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I, I was trying to type in something into the chat, but I'll do it before the end. I, I'm not very good at multitasking, which um, I perhaps should be as I was a primary teacher, parent, come a lot of other things um, uh, in, in the past, but there we go. Um, I think uh, what I wanted to do was reflect a little bit on um, the, the Scottish situation um, from my perspective, as I was asked to by yourself, Georgia and, um, and Gary. And uh, also then um, we have heard some really important feedback from the different groups. And so I don't intend to summarize them in great detail, but I would also like to reflect on what I listened to this morning, if that's okay, which was the main ministerial um, uh, event uh, in, in in, in, um, in the UN talks, which took place um, in this context of the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, uh, so um, in terms of um, climate and gender and the ways in which we live on the land, um, I mean, we, we all have to focus on the fact that we are in a climate and nature emergency and that those are, as I always argue, and we all know, are fused and interrelated um with each other um, and it's good that the scottish government has recognized that um in scotland and that all the political parties have as well um, and um as as an msp um, and more recently as scottish labor's um special advisor on cop 26 i have always held and still hold um the the plight and the challenges faced by women and the the, the actions taken by women um, locally and nationally and globally um, in my heart and mind in relation to every political action, um, and not least in relation to the land. And a figure came up today in one of the workshops that I think it's 70% of the farmers in the world are, are women. And uh, that, that we need to recognize and make sure that those voices are really heard. Um, Working in many ways with other parties and beyond, when I was Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Climate Change, Land Reform and Environment, I was able with others to ensure that climate justice and sustainable development um, were formally recognised in our Scottish Climate Change Act in 2019. And I think that is very important, especially as was mentioned, I think by, by Kat earlier, um, the um, SPG 17. Um, and the global south really does matter when we're addressing these issues. Our own local communities matter, and so do the local communities elsewhere um, across, the, uh, across the world. And we did manage to get recognition that the global south must be taken into account in all policies as well in the, in the Scottish Parliament when, we're, when we were assessing things. Good targets, as we have now in Scotland, and we all know what they are, so I won't go into them, and we've got them collectively, uh, are all fine and well, but it's how we get there that matters, whether it's on the land or whatever, whatever, wherever it is. And um, along with others, um, I, I fought to get the Just Transition Commission enshrined in law. And I think this is important in the context of land and agriculture and land use. And it, it was disbanded, as many will know, and now it's been reactivated, restarted. And this must go on right the way through until we get to net zero. Um, and it's only with our voices being loud and clear as women and girls and those men that support uh, gender equality uh, that we will, we will be able to really demand that women's voices are heard and that action that supports women is there for education, for women in trade unions, for women um, uh, who and men who want to break down occupational segregation. And all these issues are things that relate just as much to the land as they do to the offshore industries or to transport or to any other aspects of the just transition. Um, 
Uh, we talked in, in one of our, in, in the agriculture and land uh, conversation that I enjoyed and learned a lot from today, we talked about support systems and how valid are support systems? Because uh, if, if uh, people who live on their land and know their land and have that ancestral knowledge, whether they happen to stay in Clydesdale where I stay or in Guatemala or in Bangladesh or by the sea, um, in the Maldives, uh, where there's so much risk, wherever they are, wherever we are, um, that that's we, we can do our own agriculture, our own um, agro um, ecology. However, I do believe that that um, that uh, my own observation from my own experience is that support systems do have their place if they are used in the right way. If they are used, for instance, like the new um, uh, post cap must be used in Scotland for agroecology. And I'll give you one example. I believe there should be a section which supports agroforestry and riparian planting so that we protect our, our rivers and our basin, our river basins and farmers can contribute to uh, flood management while also um, giving more shelter to, to whatever we're growing and making sure that, um, that uh, there is a, a, a positive and pleasant environment for everybody. And that's urban and rural as well. Um, as, a, as a member of the parliament, I was also in the Scottish co-op group and cooperatives, I believe, have a really fundamental role in agriculture as well. Um, I, I, last week, I was chairing an event for Forest for um, the Woodland Trust, and I listened to Morag Patterson, a photographic um, worker who you may know, whose zero footprint is inspiration. And she said this uh, for this event today, uh, we could make a much greater use of artists, as we've heard today from the wonderful artists taking part today, um, in everything from local environment and communications to national level policy and strategy making. Artists' ability to think laterally and creatively, identify and explore cracks in non-hierarchical and non-judgmental investigation can shift polarized narratives and help to deconstruct embedded assumptions and behaviors. And I think that's, that's um, something that we would probably all agree with. So lastly, I just want to say that the ministerial roundtable sessions, which I listened to this morning, and I will put into the, web, into, into the chat, the website for, I would really encourage you to listen to, um, and the UN Secretary General Special Representative on Risk Reduction, um, Ms. Madatiki, if I have her name right, summarized as follows the importance of leadership and economic empowerment of women. So we become agents of change as if we aren't already, but even more so. Governance as the foundation of good planning policy and legislation, the importance of sex disaggregated data, investing in all these policies, investing finance. She also stressed the need to recognize and address the effects of climate change, which raise domestic violence. Um, levels against women and girls, which we don't have time to go into the reasons for that, but will be obvious to many of us, and we need to address that. And finally, more science and evidence to share with women and girls through education and training. And this is the essence of progress, all of this for collective, global, national and local, uh, local action. And we really have heard a lot of this today, many synergies with our own discussions and determination to act has come up today. And so uh, the team is going to produce a one pager. This is always so valuable for busy people from all disciplines. And uh, I, I pay respects to UN House today. And also uh, let's not forget all the interns who make incredible contributions as well. And people across the world who believe in and support UN House. And also I'd like to pay respect to Gary as the chief executive and to thank Georgia for all the work and the whole team for all the work that they've done today. And uh, I think as an MSP, I found these, um, uh, these one pages a great way when you're busy, you can just hold up one page and say, hey, that's what we need to think about for climate and gender and the land. And that's, that's just so helpful. So I understand there will be a podcast series um, about these discussions and do follow all that. And I hope 
um, that we can inform environmental and social policy and widen engagement through those. I speak as if I'm part of UN House, but I kind of feel I am. And so um, I want to heartily thank you all, and I will pass back to Georgia, um, and I'll try quickly to write the, the link to the UN um, event, um, well, the, the ministerial event that I referred to. So thank you very much. Hey, uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we will be posting the event recording on YouTube in the coming weeks. And in the meantime, please do stay in touch with us at UN House Scotland. Um, thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of CSW and have a really good evening.